right. Well, good morning. Good morning. Right. Good to see you guys here. Well, we've been continuing on in our journey of. Uh, it's like being in Bianca. I'm sorry. I like to walk, so uh, I'm sorry if I get too close. What's good is I'm looking right at the top of your head. I'm not looking at you. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Come on through Second Peter, and last week we started a section where Peter is addressing, you know, false teachers. And that's kind of the main thrust of this whole book is is beware of the false teachers. All of them, the the pretty much they're saying, you know, hey, uh, you know, these teachers are saying there's there's no judgment coming. There's, there's no second coming of Christ. We're not going to face judgment, so we don't have to worry about how we're living. Um, and he's going after them. Well, uh, today uh, he's going to learn some more about how to how to identify these false teachers right because it's important to be able to identify them, right i remember growing up back in kansas we had a lot of snakes and we had bull snakes or i think you're kind of gopher snakes uh bull snakes and rattlers and they look a lot alike you know the same uh color about the only the only way to tell the difference is to look at the very end look for that rattle or the head shaped diamond shape well we don't we didn't have the diamond oh. we don't have the diamond we were just the western rattle, rattlesnake. Uh, you had to look at the, at, the, at the tail to know the difference, because why is it important to know the difference? So you don't get bit. One can kill you. Yeah. <laughs> one will kill you. <laughs> the other one will just be like, oh, okay, you got me. You're not, not a big deal. That, that's kind of a big deal to know. You know there's, there's other snakes like that, too, right? You guys heard the, the coral snake and the, and the scarlet king snake. They both have banded colors all the way down. And they all have three colors, black, red, and yellow. The key is to get those in the right order, because <laughs> that's very key. I know the saying. For yeah, we're gonna, okay. don't, don't jump ahead of me, Cheryl. <laughs> Come on now. This is my sermon. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I got excited. <laughs> no, yeah. They have the three colors, and it's very important to get those in the right order, because is a uh, scarlet king snake poisonous? No. no. Is, is a coral snake poisonous? Yes. Uh, so, you got to know the saying, right? And red next to yellow kills a fellow. That's the one I grew up with. What's the one you red, have? Red on black, we wear a jet. Yeah. Red like, on black, we wear a jet. Oh, yeah. And then red yeah. on yellow. Kill a fellow. No. No. What was it? And now I just made me forget. Red on yellow, it's a good fellow or something like that. No, no. I didn't write it down. <laughs> red next to yellow kills a fellow. Is how I've okay, always heard. Red next to yellow. Yeah, venom oh, black. Okay. Yeah, venom black. Okay. I just said my mom. Sorry, so I shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've heard the jack too. Yeah, red, red on black, venom, the venom black. black. Yeah, so that that's a good one. Yeah, you had to stay away from. It. But still, if you have a close encounter with it, you want to know if it's poisonous or not. You know, it's important to know that for snakes, but. You know, snakes, what, what, what will they do? They'll, they'll kill you physically, right? And then, hey, they'll you're scare they, the heck yeah, they, you. They, 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 they didn't scare you. But with these false teachers, what will they do to you if you follow them? Kill you, kill you spiritually. Yes, we can follow them to hell, pretty much. They exploit you. They feed off of you. They will kill you spiritually. So it's very important to be able to identify them. And that's what we're going to cover today. So if you got your Bibles, I should have bought a stack up. I didn't think about that. Um, open to 2 Peter, chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 10. We're going to cover the last section of verse 10. So 2 Peter, chapter 2, starting in the last part of verse 10 to verse 20. So let me pray before we go. So Father, we just pray for your hand upon this message now as... As we go into your word, Lord, your word is truthful, it is perfect, is all that we need. So, Father, I pray that we would just, just bask in your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'm going to start reading in the last part of verse 2, or verse 10, sorry. Talking about false teachers, Peter writes, Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, 
born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions, while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These or waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For, speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to have known, the, for never have to know the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Those are some pretty strong words. Yes, they are. <laughs> Remember last week we talked about this is a serious issue. You know, this isn't something to just kind of pass on. This is serious. But remember the quote? The, the, the person said, you know, when we come to church, we should treat it like we need to put construction tape around the outside. We have hard hats on, okay? Let's put our hard hats on. We're getting into God's Word. Some serious God Word. This is not going to be another rah-rah sermon. Sorry. This is going to be another you know, check yourself sermon. So road, road, uh, the road plan for today is we're going to look at the profile of a false teacher. Um, you know, verse by verse through here. And then I'm going to finish up with five questions for you to ask yourself. And ask of false teachers. So what, what does this false teacher look like? Well, Everybody first, else. <laughs> verse 10, they blaspheme beings in manners he doesn't understand. They're in verse 10, bold and willful. Bold and willful. They're arrogant. They're arrogant. What is it? He doesn't say confident. He says arrogant. You know, and arrogance is just confidence without the humility. They're arrogant. They're bold, willful. They do not tremble. As they blaspheme the glorious ones. Now, there's a lot of discussion. What in the world is this glorious ones? Uh, I think in the context, uh, he's talking about the fallen angels. Because in the next verse, he's saying, "Hey, the the angels, you know, they don't even blaspheme uh, the ones that are fallen. You know, the, the the casting judgment is only reserved for God. It's not for man to to be you know casting judgment on." These fallen angels to slander these these fallen angels. That's God's, not not man's job, and that's what he's saying there in verse ten. And not only that, they he, he they, they get into things where they don't in, even understand. In verse twelve, they blaspheme about matters of which they're ignorant. And will be destroyed in their destruction. Verse eleven. This is stark contrast, isn't it? Angels. Mighty creatures aren't going to blaspheme, but these false teachers will. You know, they always think of someone who, who thinks they know everything about what you're talking about, but they don't really. You know, after, after a while, you're like, okay, this guy's just blowing smoke. You know, <coughs> you know he, he's just making stuff up as they go. You know, you know those people. What yeah. do you do? You kind of try to distance yourself, get away from the conversation, because they're just blowing smoke. Trying to, trying to act like they know what they're talking about, but they really don't. <laughs> oh, that's what's going on here. These people are just blowing smoke, making a smoke screen to their teaching. Not only do they blaspheme in matters he doesn't understand, he acts before he thinks. Look at verse 12. Whew. Like irrational animals. 
creatures of instinct. And what, what, what are these creatures around for? To be caught and destroyed. That, that's, that's how they're acting. They're just acting out. They're not, they're not thinking about what they're doing. Last thing about matters with their ignorant. They are to be destroyed in their destruction. I love the Greek there. Not just destroyed, but destroyed in their destruction. <laughs> it's a massive destruction that's going to happen here. So you see their attitude. They're bold and willful. They see their actions. They, they just act without thinking. And their fate is that they are destined to destruction. In verse 15, we see that they're crazy. We're seeking the right way, they're going to stray. The way of the Balaam, that's from Numbers 22. Sorry, I'm trying to get this paper folded back. Numbers 22, where Balaam was, and in, in Jewish history, he's largely regarded as the source of leading Israel astray into sexual immorality. And he's going out one time, creates some mischief, and the donkey won't obey him. And that's what he said. They followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. They want gain. And who is rebuked by? A speechless donkey. A speechless donkey had more sanity than Balaam. And that's what Peter's comparing these false teachers to. It's pretty crazy. So that's kind of who they are. Now let's look at the impact. Starting in verse 16. You're going to see their impact first on themselves and then to others as well. So in verse 17, these are waterless springs. Mist driven by a storm. And when you see a spring, or like think of like an oasis in a desert, you know, like, you, you're, oh, there's water, you know, and you go there and you find no water. How do you feel? Oh, you know, you, you, you're, you're in desperate need of rain and you see the storm coming. And, and you maybe you get a little fine you know, sprinkle going, all right, it's going to come. It's going to come. Like what we desperately need right here is rain to come. And it comes. And then the clouds just pass and don't actually produce anything. That's what the kind of impact they have. They, have, they look great. There's a lot going on, but they possess nothing. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking... Loud boasts of folly. Loud boasts of folly. I think that's a very key thing on identifying some of these bad teachers, these false teachers. Are they boastful? Are they making these big claims that, that, that something's going to happen and it never happens? That's a sign of a false teacher. Promise great things. And not only that, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh, those who are barely capable of those who live in error. He, he, he's talking about a lot of the young believers. They, they take young believers and they just lead them astray. Enticed by sensual passions. Remember, these false teachers are saying, oh, there, there's not going to be any judgment. God's not going to judge you. Just live how you want to live. That's what they're doing. The sensual passions. That's sexual sin, sexual immor immorality. The primary way they're going to do it. I know we think of big things when we think of sexual morality, but sexual morality can come in very, very different things. What you like on the internet, how you view the opposite sex. If you're a carnal person addicted to sin, you're walking down the street, all you're going to be doing is checking out the opposite sex as they walk by. That's sexual sin. And it will continue to be in that. If you, and that's, they don't want to direct you away from that. They're going to let you keep on doing it. And in verse 20. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. It would have been better for them to have known the way of righteousness than knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Now, this is kind of confusing. Are they talking about people losing their salvation here? Because it's kind of, you know, like it. it's better for them to have known. Mm -hmm. But we, we also need to remember, even back in 1 Peter, Peter talked about the, and the perseverance of the saints. The saints will not fall. So to make his point here, he's using 
that language, where you got to balance it with what he says elsewhere, he's saying, you know, these people had the knowledge, but, but they weren't truly Christians. They, they, they were part of the church. They, they, they you know, and so much of the American church, we're all about saying the sinner's prayer and being saved. So these people do the prayer and then they're baptized. But then but there's actually nothing here in the heart. And guess what? They grow up and they start leading people astray. They look it, but unfortunately they don't know it. They don't truly know it. And it's going to be bad for them. And he's talking about false teachers. Um, he also could be talking about recent uh, recent converts here, new believers. It's hard to say exactly which one. But for both, it's a warning. They look Christian, they want Christian, but their hearts were not. Their hearts were not in it. <laughs> because going back to the animal illustration about you know how their their dogs and their animals ready to be caught and killed. Verse 22, what the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. These people, though, saying they're safe, saying they're, they're part of the church, truly aren't. And they're going to go back to that sin. They're going to go back to their own vomit. I know a lot of people have dogs around here. I've seen dogs, and then dogs go back and dogs eat, are gross. eat their own vomit. You know, dogs eat anything. That's gross. You don't want to be a part of that. All right. To sum it up here, we got five questions. Put put rubber meets the road. Five questions to help identify false teachers. Five questions here. First question, what are they teaching about God? What are they teaching about God? Nothing. I've seen a lot of people, they only, they'll only preach the love of God. They won't preach God, the loving God, but God also the wrathful God and the just God who will pour out punishment on those who do not believe and follow him. We must have the complete picture of God. They also also must properly teach the Trinity. You know, there's, there's, there's cults out there that profess to be Christian. But when you get into how they define their God, that's where they're, that's where they're wrong. Those are false teachers. They, they, they say they're Christian, but they're not. How do they define God? What are they teaching about God? Are they teaching all the aspects about God? Not just the ones that we like to hear not just the ones that make us feel good, that God loves us, and that we're all going to be okay. No, no. <laughs> we're not. We take work. Next question. What are they teaching about us? What are they teaching about us? Are they going to... I guess I just said it. Are they going to say, we're all going to be all right? D don't, you know, in the end... Hell isn't really real. It's an illustration. Don't worry about the judgment. No. We are fallen. We have sinned before God, and that is our standing. We deserve God's wrath. That's your pat on the back for today. You're a sinner. You deserve God's wrath. Okay? But it's only through Jesus. We'll get to that in a section. I've heard popular... Preachers that, you know, they're on TV, and, and I've heard out of their mouths, they say, we are gods, little g. I'm like, where are you getting this? <laughs> it's totally taking context and just misteaching, mispreaching everything. Those are false teachers, but they have millions of followers because it, it tickles their ears and makes them feel good. That we're gods, that we're powerful. We can call upon the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit and control the Holy Spirit and do all these great things. No, we can't control the Holy Spirit. That is God. That's part of the Trinity. We could cry out to the Holy Spirit and pray that he works. We can't control it. We are the creation. We're not the creator. We are fallen. We deserve God's wrath. If they're teaching anything other than that, False teaching. Third question. What are they teaching about 
salvation. What are they teaching about salvation? Salvation. We are sinners that deserve God's wrath. That's who we are. But because of the price that Christ paid on the cross for us, He went to the cross willingly to pay the debt for our sin. All we have to do is surrender our lives to Him. Surrender our lives to Him. Welcome Him into our hearts. And that free gift is there. You know, he, he's of the debt we owe to God for our sin. He, he's written out the check for you. All you got to do is turn it over and endorse it on the back and say, "Yep, I'll accept that," and then live a life that reflects that. That's the gospel. So many other church, I've heard people that they add to it. If you were truly saved, then the Holy Spirit will come upon you. If you are truly saved, then you will experience blessing. If you are truly saved, you'll experience prosperity. If you're truly saved, you'll experience health and healing. Have you read Paul's letters? Have you been reading what's going on here? That is not the gospel. We talked about the, you know, the prosperity gospel, the health and wealth gospel. That is wrong. Salvation is simply the cross. Nothing else added to it. Fourth question. What are they teaching about being a Christian? What are they teaching about being a Christian? About living our daily lives? It's going back to the prosperity, health, and wealth. Are they saying our lives are going to be great? You know, I, lo I, 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 I love seeing these books on the Christian book sales. Your best life now. <laughs> Is that really what the Bible says? Mm -mm. Now? No. I, th I think a better title of a book, and I love this book, is instead of your best life now, it's called The Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Christianity is not, oh, I'm good now. I'm powerful. I'm healed. I I'm fully sanctified. I know exactly what God wants. I can live in it. No. <laughs> That's not how it goes. It's a long obedience in the same direction. Of growing from that point of salvation, you continue to grow and grow. You fall, you get back up. You fall, you get back up. You fall twice, then you get back up once. You fall three times, you still keep getting up. You keep going in the same direction. It's not a, you know, what we love in America is those quick, great feelings. The, the instant gratification. Guess what? God is not an instant gratification God. He is a patient, long-suffering God. If he was an instant gratification God, he would have wiped us out back in the Garden of Eden and instantly gratified his desires when his creation sinned against him. But he is a long-suffering God, a patient God, so that even now we have a chance to live for him and surrender our lives to him. Being a Christian is hard. You will suffer you will get sick you will lose your job you will go broke read paul's letters it's throughout there look at the lives of the apostles they're all martyred they were killed for their faith it's not a health and wealth gospel it's not a prosperity gospel it's a long obedience in the same direction that's what it means to be a christian and fifth, quest, fifth question, is what they are preaching, will it apply universally? Will it apply to other parts of the world? And this is a big one, I like. Especially when it comes to prosperity gospel, the health and wealth gospel. Is when they say, you know, your best life now, does that make any sense to Christians that are in prison in North Korea right now? Does that make any sense that when, when these popular American pastors that are on TV and have these huge churches say, God wants to pour out his blessings on you, does that make sense to the Christians in Africa that are getting massacred by the Muslims? That God wants to pour out his blessings? The blessings they're experiencing are not earthly blessings. They're spiritual blessings. 
that though they're they're staying the fight, they're standing for their faith and dying for it. And now they're in the presence of God. So much is what, of what is being taught here in America would make absolutely no sense around the world. And you do realize that the fastest growing areas in the world of Christianity is Africa, India, China, North Korea. We're on the decline here in America. Could it be why that we're, we're, we're skewing the Gospels to make us feel better? Are we skewing the Gospels so that we don't have to change our lives? It's an excuse. God loves me. He's not going to punish me, so why should I change my life? I'm saved. Why, why should I put an internet filter on my computer so that I can't go to the porn sites? God's not going to hate me. God's, God's not going to judge me. That's what they're being taught. They're being taught, and it's all Satan's fault. Guess what? The sin isn't us. We are sinful. And we can take that and work with it, but we are the source of the problem. We are the sinful people. We are the ones that have thrown our lives and stuck our thumb out, stuck our middle finger up to God and said, we can do this on our own. And it's only through His grace, through His love, through His justness that He sent His Son to die on the cross for that us. Because without that, there's no way we could have paid the price that we deserve. So the five questions, again, in closing. What are they teaching about God? What are they teaching about us? What are they teaching about salvation? What are they teaching about being a Christian? And does what they're teaching apply universally? And I think those five questions are great as we come to a time now of, of taking communion. Ask yourself, what do you believe about God? Do you believe that you are a sinner and fallen short of the glory of God? Do you believe that Christ went to the cross for us to pay the price for our sin and rose from the grave, defeating death? Do you believe that Christianity is hard? It's not easy. It is hard. It's a gut check question. Before we take communion. Let's pray now as we prepare our hearts to take communion. So, Father, we, we do pray right now for you to work in our hearts, the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we've given tools to identify false teachings, Lord, we, we use those same questions to turn them inward and identify false teaching in our own lives. Identify sin in our own lives, Lord, and to be able to turn that around and confess our sin and call upon you to help us. Not do it on our own, but upon the, the, the strength of Christ and on the power of the Holy Spirit through the sovereignty of God. Well, do that now as we prepare for communion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.